So thank you very much, uh, first to the organizers for inviting me to, to give a talk here. It's an honor to be giving a talk uh, at CIRM. And thank you for all that uh, have uh, that are here in the room, because uh, it's been a day of very interesting talks, but also a long day. Um, so as he was saying, I am going to talk about random hyperbolic three manifolds. So let me start by giving you a bit of motivation on why it is something interesting to study. Um, so in three dimensions, there is this really big theorem, uh, which is most called the Thurston geometrization conjecture, which is a theorem that was proved later by Perlman in 2006, that in very, very general lines says that every nice enough, nice enough meaning close, orientable, three manifold, uh, can be cut into pieces, uh, each, of them, each of them admitting a, a geometric structure among all the eight possible geometries that there is in dimension three. So um, all the three manifolds admitting the other types of geometry that is in dimension three are by now really well understood and well studied. There is sort of a classification of the theorems admitting these other types of geometry. But it's not the case for the hyperbolic manifolds. So for these ones, we still know very little because they are the most complicated to study. And in particular, uh, there is a lot of open questions, for instance, regarding the growth of some of the geometric invariants of these manifolds, like the volume or the diameter or the length of the geodesics, etc. And uh, so a way to, to attract or to, to attack all these all this, uh, problems regarding this you know, typical behavior, asymptotic behavior, etc., is uh, through probabilistic methods, in this case, via uh, the study of random uh, manifolds. So this approach has been, uh, has been proven to be very useful in other fields, as you might know, like graph theory, for instance, and also now in, in, in geometry. Um, OK, so in my case, I am particularly interested in one geometric invariant, which is the length spectrum, which I'm going to define at some point during the talk. And concerning this uh, length spectrum, we know the following. So the length spectrum of a compact random hyperbolic three manifold with boundary. converges to a Poisson point process of computable intensity lambda. All right, so I am aware that there might be some concepts here that are not well known for everyone in the room. So actually, the goal of my talk will be to try to explain uh, what the theorem means. So I'm going to try to introduce all the necessary and the concepts that appear in these boards in order to, to explain what the theorem says. So let me just write it down. So the goal the talk will be to explain this result. And then with the time remaining, I will try to give like a big of the ideas that go that go into the proof. So uh, I also know that there might be a few people here that I know already what I'm talking about and so what I'm going to talk about during the whole talk. Uh, if it's your case, you can just, you know, relax, sit back and enjoy your post nap. 
Um, hopefully it's not everyone that does that. <laughs> so for the ones that are awake still, let me try to start from the very beginning, which is uh, introducing the, the base object of uh, study, which is hyperbole manifolds. Uh, so let me start here. Okay, so um, I start from the with the definition. So the usual, maybe a bit technical definition of hyperbolic manifold, which is it can be generalized to to every dimension, but I'm going to just stick to three for the whole talk, is the following. So a hyperbolic manifold is a complete Riemannian manifold, manifold um, with constant sectional curvature equal to minus one. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, so equivalently, we can think of the hyperbolic three manifolds at uh, something that locally looks at the hyperbolic three space. So equivalently is a complete Riemannian manifold which looks hope, locally like H3. Um, so now the question becomes, what does H3 look like? <laughs> uh, so a concrete way of thinking about the hyperbolic three space is by considering a model. So there are several models, as in dimension two, there are several models of, uh, of considering the, the hyperbolic three space and one of them, one of the most used, maybe, is the one uh, named the, the Poincare ball. <coughs> this is the generalization of the Poincare disk uh, that you have seen already. So in this, uh, in this model, the hyperbolic three space is defined as a point in the unit ball, so the x, y, z in R3, such that x squared plus i squared plus z squared is strictly less than one. And this is equipped with the metric defined as follows. Okay, I don't know if you, everyone sees. Um, so this might seem like a complicated expression, but it's nothing else than just a conformal transformation of the Euclidean metric. So here, we have the hyperbolic three space as this, as this ball, and then, for instance, if we consider any two points in this ball, we have that since the distance is no longer the Euclidean distance, so some, some, some other thing, then the, the path realizing the minimal distance between any two points are no longer gonna be the straight lines. So in this case, the path realizing the minimal distance between these two points is gonna be some semicircle that, go, that it's orthogonal to the boundary. So either this, or we have two points like that, then it's gonna be 
a straight line that goes through the center. So this path realizing the minimum distance between any two points in hyperbolic tree space is what we call uh, geodesics. All right. So now we know what the hyperbolic three manifold is. So we can oh, check this and go on to the following step, which is now what a random manifold is. Right. All right, so one, uh, the intuitive idea behind the, the, the concept around the manifold is you have a set of manifolds, and then to this set you can put a probability measure, and so you have this probability space, and then the con this concept of random manifold kind of makes sense. But in order to, to study, to do something with them, we need to specify a model of construction. So in three dimension, there's, there's three principal models of construction of uh, around the manifolds. Uh, the first one, maybe it's the most known one, which is called the random Heer splittings. Then we have uh, another one, which is called random mapping tori. And finally, the one I'm going to talk about in this talk, which is named like random triangulation. Okay, so this, this um, model of random triangulation was introduced by Bram Petri and Jean Cambo, all both in this cell, um, in 2020. And it consists of the following. So the general idea is to try to construct uh, manifolds by randomly gluing polyhedra along the faces. So the idea is random gluing of polyhedra along their faces. And so there is an analogous of this model in dimension two. And in dimension two, what they, what they do is they take triangles. And so they, they glue these triangles along the edges. And so if you do that in a random way, you obtain a random surface. So here for, for dimension three, a priori one thing that the, the, the the natural choice to do the same uh, procedure would be the three simplex, which is the tetrahedron. But of course, it couldn't be that straightforward. So this doesn't work. And um, here's why. So if we consider Xn to be the complex of uh, antitrahedra, it was proved by Dunfield and Thurston then the probability that this oops, Xn is actually a manifold tends to zero as the number of tetrahedra you consider to, to build your complex goes to infinity. So an, as n goes to infinity. 
And this is due to the fact that typically the neighborhoods of the vertices are not homeomorphic to R3. All right, so we have this, this problem at the vertices. Uh, what can we do? Maybe we can try to just take the problematic points out and see what happens. And so we can... We can try to consider what it should be a truncated tetrahedron. So if we consider this as our building block instead of that, the problem that we had uh, goes away. And so if we take copies of a truncated tetrahedra, and we glue this truncated tetrahedra along the hexagonal faces. So this face is in green. What we obtain is a manifold. And in particular, what we obtain is a compact three manifold. Uh, with boundary. That we will denote by mn, when n is the number of uh, truncated tetrahedra that we take initially to build our complex. So the boundary uh, comes from these this, uh, triangular faces that we have, uh, that, that are being created when, when chopping off the edges. The vertices, sorry. So this four. All right. So um, so before continuing, just to say um, the random aspect of the whole, all of this construction comes from the gluing. So in this case, we consider, for instance, n copies of, of, of a truncated tetrahedra. So we have four n uh, hexagonal faces. So we, we pair these four n hexagonal faces uniformly at random. And then for every pair of faces, there is three possible orientation reversing gluings that we can do. And so we pick one of these three order reversing orientations also uniformly at random. And that's why the, the manifold that we obtain at the end is something, is a random manifold. All right, so we have this, this uh, construction that in which we get some, some compact three manifold, but as I was saying at the beginning of the talk, we are interested in studying hypervolume manifolds. Well, it turns out that as it was proven by the same authors of the, of the article, that these manifolds are gonna be hyperbolic with the probability tending to one. The probability that the, this MN uh, carry hyperbolic metric with totally in boundary goes to one as the number of the trader goes to infinity. So this tells us in particular that this is a very is a good model to, to study properties of hyperbolic manifolds. Okay, so um, the fact that this MN carry hyperbolic metric is maybe not something that we can see straightforward from the, from the, from the construction of this, uh, of this manifold. 
So a way to kind of see how we can get to that conclusion is by doing the following construction. Yeah, so here I didn't mention, thank you, I didn't mention um, in this case there is, in three dimension there is this, this result which is called most rigidity theorem that tells us that if uh, a manifold carries a hyperbolic metric then this metric is unique up to isometry. So it's unique, it's, in this case it's, it, the metric is unique. All right, so how can we see more or less that uh, this has a hyperbolic metric? So for that, we do the following construction. Let me say. Okay, so the first thing that uh, we observe is that if we take a truncated tetrahedra and uh, we consider what is called interior edges, but this, these edges in green, and we collapse these edges. We, we see that the hexagonal faces here become triangular faces. And so if we do that for every hexagonal face here, we, we obtain, from this one, we obtain another polyhedron. Does someone have an idea of what would that look like? It's not easy to say, but... Okay, so after these five seconds, I'm gonna say it. Um, so if we contract all these green edges in here, what we obtain is actually an octahedron. Um, so by contracting the green edges um, in every truncated tetrahedra in MN, which is the previous one, what we obtain is another manifold that we will denote by the YN which is, uh, again, a three manifold boundary. But in this case, made of uh, gluing of uh, octahedra. So just a little remark. Here we were, we were gluing this truncated uh, tetrahedra along the hexagonal faces, which are four of them. Uh, so this gluing here will be translated there uh, into the gluing of four of the non-adjacent faces, because the other four uh, faces correspond to the boundary ones. So here will be just... Uh, Maybe this four. I don't know if it's very clear, but anyway. Um, all right, so after this first step, 
in order to put a metric uh, on this new manifold, we can use some, some fact from hyperbolic geometry. And we can use, in particular, that we can endow each of the octahedron with the hyperbolic metric of uh, what is called an ideal right angle regular octahedron. So what it is, what is an ideal right angle regular octahedron. So if we model our, our have have street space by the Poincare ball, we see that this uh, this polyhedra is some is some polyhedra that, that lives in uh, in the hyperbolic three space and in which all the vertices are points that are at infinity. That's where the ideal comes from. And uh, and uh, the right angle comes from the fact that the angles between the faces are, are right angles. So this is a convex set in the hyperbolic sphere space. So this, this has a hyperbolic metric, which is unique up to isometry. And what we can do is we can endow each of these octahedron with a hyperbolic metric of this of these uh, things. What we that this y m becomes oh, sorry a complete finite volume uh, hyperbolic. Three manifold with totally geodesic boundary. All right. So by doing all this, we have obtained something, some new manifold that is uh, is hyperbolic by construction. And now what we can try to do as a third step is to try to recover the manifold MN, which is the one we we're interested in actually. Uh, we can try to recover this MN from the YN, this one there, via some uh, technique which is common, very common used in the three dimension, which is called via dam fillings. So very general lines, then, then filling is a procedure in which you can, uh, so you have, for, for instance, a three manifold width with toroidal boundary. The then filling would be to, to, this toroidal, to, to this toroidal boundary, you, you, you attach, you fill them with a solid toroid. So in this case, we do a special kind of uh, then filling, which goes as follows. So now I'm gonna do the drawing, the most difficult drawing I have. I hope it's kind of understandable.
not going to be very long, sorry. All right, so I don't know if you see more or less what is happening here, but it's supposed to be eight, uh, six, no, six uh, octahedra glued along together like this. All right. So uh, this is something I, I haven't said, but the the boundary of of uh, the manifold Y n that we have constructed somewhere uh, is actually a hyperbolic hyperbolic surface with cusp. So this is not obvious, but in order to know more about it, I, I, I would recommend going to the to the authors of the of the article. So in this case, here we would have a piece of boundary which consists in this <coughs> in these six uh, triangles. So what we do actually is we consider, so this is, the, this is a cup, this is a cusp. So what we do is we, we take out We take out a uh, um, neighborhood of the cusp, a hierophysical neighborhood of the cusp, which in this case is just an open cylinder. That we can see as a half torr. And then we glue, we fill this, this the space with a solid cylinder. In order to compactify all the cusps. Um, so if we do this compactification procedure uh, to YN, we can recover the, the MN. We can see it as, uh, like that. And um, with all this procedure, very general, we see that the hypervolumetric that we have found there also kind of remains when doing all this compactification procedure. So I tell of this, all this story first because it's interesting and second because both the manifolds YN and, uh, and this compactification procedure will, will take a role in the, in the proof of the theorem that we are supposed to talk about today. Uh, so here, just to control the change in geometry when, when doing all the dam filling of the cusp. Uh, we use, uh, basically, we use, no, they use <laughs> uh, two tools. One is Andrew's theorem, and then the other is one result of uh, Potter. Purcell and Slimer. In order to make sure that the that the, the geometry doesn't change too much. Okay, so now we are experts in random manifolds, and uh, it remains only. Um, the concept maybe of length spectrum. So let's define it. Uh, should I use third board? No, I don't think so. So the length spectrum is a geometric invariant of a manifold that, that is defined as follow. We consider M a hyperbolic manifold.
then the length spectrum, which is the node with, with this L of M, is going to be the multiset, because it has uh, some multiplicity, of length of all closed geodesics. in M. So this set could look like a huge mess, uh, but it's actually countable. And um, the fact that this is countable is a consequence of a fact that was uh, mentioned in the, in the talk of uh, Hugo Parlier which was that in uh, every free homotopy class of essential uh, closed curves in a hyperbolic manifold, there exists a unique uh, closed geodesic that minimizes the length in this homotopy class. And so the, when we count uh, closed geodesics, we are actually counting three homotopy classes. And so this, uh, this is something that is countable. Um, all right, so up to now, we have defined the three principal concepts that uh, appear here. So actually, this can be reread as follows. So the length spectrum of a random hyperbolic three manifold with boundary is the length spectrum of the MN that we have constructed here converges in distribution. Oh, I didn't say how. Okay. So converges in distribution as the volume goes to infinity to a Poisson point process of uh, intensity lambda. Okay. Um, okay, so now that we understand a bit more uh, what the theorem says, <coughs> let me give you a bit of an intuition of how the, how the proof goes. So let me just use this word. So the first thing that I would like to say is that this is a kind of a concise way of uh, stating the result, but in order to prove it, we, uh, I use uh, a different reformulation in more geometrical terms. So what I actually prove is the following. So we can encode, let me use reformulation. What we do is we encode the length spectrum of Mn uh, via the, the following uh, random variables. So given for, e, for every A and B uh, positive fields, let's say A, A less than B, we consider with a fine the random variable as C A in, in the interval AV of MN 
as the number of closed geodesics in MN of length between A and B. And once we consider this, what we do is we study the behavior of this random variable, of this random variable. And so actually, what we prove is that for every A1 less than B1 AK less BK, the vector of random variables C A1 B1 of MN C A K VK of MN converges in distribution <coughs> to a vector of independent random variables. Independent uh, were some random variables. of parameter that depends only on the interval that, that is defined the, the random variable. So the ones maybe more familiar with the concept of Poisson prime process may seem maybe the kind of the similarity between the two, the two statements. Okay. So this is actually the way we kind of we formulate it in order to prove it. And finally, let me tell a bit what are the ideas that go into the proof of the theorem. Right. So the the um, proof of this theorem is kind of it, it, it separated in two big steps. So the first step is uh, that what we do is we actually prove this uh, statement, but not for the manifolds M N, but for the manifolds Y N that we have constructed. Okay, so how, how the proof goes in this case. Um, so what we do first is that we, we look at the dual graph of this complex. And what is the dual graph of this uh, complex of octahedra? So, What we do is um, it's constructed in the following way. So in every octahedron in, in the complex, we, we put a vertex. And then we join this vertex via an edge, whether they have some phase in common. So since they are glued either to themselves or to another um, through four non-adjacent phases, we see that the the dual graph, which I denote like this, of this uh, complex is going to be a random four regular graph. Um, 
All right, so now um, we use the fact that we can, once we have this, we use the fact that we can, we can curves in our manifold can be homotope to paths in the dual graph. And now we also we we make use of the fact that I stated uh, before, which was that in every uh, free homotopy class there exists a unique uh, closed geodesic. Um, to kind of conclude that we can uh, translate the problem of uh, counting closed geodesics of a certain length into the purely combinatorial problem of counting certain types of cycles in the dual graph. And then, finally, because I don't have much time, um, in order to get this, this um, conversion in, in distribution, what we use is a classic method in probability, which is the method of moments. So for, for the Poisson conversions. All right, so this will be the first step of the proof. And then, maybe I can do it here. <laughs> and then finally, The second step of the proof would be, once we know that the, the, the statement holds for the manifolds Yn, try to prove that after this compactification that we have mentioned before, uh, it is still true by, for the compactified manifolds so or for the Mn. Then we have defined for it. So proof. That after Compactification, it holds also for Mn. And to check that, it comes down basically uh, to check in two things. The main one is uh, to prove that after this compactification procedure, the length of the curves doesn't ch don't change too much. So we prove that And for this, this step of the proof, we use kind of the same results to control the change in geometry as it was used in here, but although for different like, objective and, and in a different way. Uh, and finally, we check the only, let's say, problem that, we, the, the, that could arise, which is like the two uh, non-homotopic clear geodesics in Yn become homotopic once we compactify the manifold. 
So what we do is we check that asymptotically almost surely this doesn't happen. So the And this, we, we do it with the help. Uh, we kind of play with the combinatorial distance between, uh, between these two curves in the, in the dual graph. And uh, for sure distance, we help ourselves with some results from, from graph theory, random theory. And uh, for when, when, when they are very far apart, we, we, these graph results doesn't help us anymore, so we kind of do uh, geometric argument using using covers, and uh, I think it's uh, it is a very very sketchy proof of the statement, but I don't think I have time for more, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>